uh, we are very honored to have Dr. Sharif here to join our Meet the Professionals program. Dr. Sharif, uh, sometimes people have confusion about psychology and the psychiatry. So could you give us a brief overview of that? Sure, of course, that's a great question. So the two terms that all people often get confused, like you mentioned, Lynn, are psychology and psychiatry. And the difference between the two is that psychology is the study of the mind the study of human emotions, of human thought and human behavior. So psychology, think of it as everything that we normally do. It's normal human thought and behavior and why we, why we act the way we do. Psychiatry, on the other hand, is everything that is abnormal, meaning this is something that is pathological. It's when we get sick and all of a sudden our thoughts our feelings, our behavior is now different and different in a way that is hurtful to us or harmful to us. It's, it's something that doesn't feel right. It feels sort of like um, difficult and uh, we, we have difficulty adjusting to it. This is what we, still, what, what we call psychiatry. So psychiatry, what my job is, is to help people who are emotionally hurting and are having difficulty with their mood, difficulty with their behavior, difficulty with their feelings, versus a psychologist is someone who helps someone to understand themselves better. So I'm feeling all these emotions and feelings, but they're not necessarily bothering me. I'm just a little confused about them. So a psychologist can help you in that regard. I'm someone who is a doctor. And as a doctor, it's my job to help people who are feeling sick. So psychiatry is a study of those who are psychologically or emotionally or behaviorally sick. I hope that helps Lynn to like. So are there any misconceptions about being a psychiatrist? Oh yeah, quite a bit, a lot. So there's, there's this feeling people have that psychiatrists are like the way we were back in like the 1800s, 1900s, that we're all like Sigmund Freud. We all like smoke pipes and you have like thick glasses and you lie down on a couch and I'm sitting there with a piece of paper and I'm saying, tell me how you feel. What do you think about this? Tell me about your dreams. I want to know. And then the person lying on the couch is sort of like, oh, you know, when I was a child, my mom and dad were upset with me and yelled at me. This is why I feel the way I do. You know, so people have this image in their head that this is what we do. This is what psychiatry is, because in the textbooks, in history, that's what it looks like. And oftentimes people get very scared because if you look at history and you look at the way psychiatry used to be, old school psychiatry, there, there would be a lot of feelings and, and, and scariness that people would experience about folks that are locked up in like cold dark like rooms and like padded walls and they're wearing like a straight jacket that like restrains them and the doctors come and then like poke needles in people and then like they poke their brain and they like um give them electric shocks and they like it's, it's very scary when you think about that and people tend to think oh my god that's what a psychiatrist does you know they're gonna lock me up they're gonna like experiment on me do like things to my brain and what I'm here to tell you then, is that it is completely, that is all in the past. We don't do any of that anymore. It's a very different field now. So my job is basically having patients come to my clinic and they tell me, Dr. Sharif, I, I'm feeling a lot of depression. I feel very sad. I feel very um, low. I feel like I'm having difficulty 
getting up out of bed in the morning. I have thoughts sometimes that I don't want to be alive anymore. And these are very scary thoughts for me. And I don't know how to handle these thoughts. Dr. Sharif, what would you do to help me? And then I would talk to patients. I would help them understand why their mind is working the way it is. What is depression? What does your depression look and feel like for you? And I would make recommendations. I think therapy would help you. Talking to someone about your emotions can help you. And I would prescribe medication. I think this specific medication will help your depression or this specific medication will help your anxiety and it'll help you feel more calm, feel more relaxed, feel more at ease. It'll make you feel happier. It'll make you feel better. So my job is to help people understand their emotions and their feelings and then prescribe treatment for it. And treatment comes in two major forms. The first is therapy, like I mentioned, which is talking about what you're feeling. And the second is medication that I would then give pills to help people feel better. So that's my job. That's what I would do. So would you say that this is a solo job? Do you work with other doctors also to give patient treatment? Yes, absolutely. I work with a huge team uh, to help patients. So first is my team, the team I work with. So my team consists of me. I'm a psychiatrist. I handle all the symptoms. I handle the medications, the treatment. I, I handle the patient care in, uh, that they need. Then next to me is a therapist. And a therapist is someone that meets with uh, my patients once a week. And they do therapy, talk therapy. So I handle medications. They handle the therapy. The next person I have on the team is a social worker. The social worker helps my patients with if they want to get a job, if they want to get housing, they want to move out of their house and move to another house, if they want to get food, like food stamps or like a food bank. Um, and the social worker helps them to get connected to services that they may need uh, for day-to-day -day living. And then the, the last team member that I have is a case manager. So a case manager is someone that helps the patient out with filling out applications, filling out paperwork, helping with taxes, helping with like getting them from place to place, arranging transportation, you know, and, and helping them with little things throughout the day that they might need help with. So all of us together work as a team to help the patient out. Then there are other doctors that I work with, and this is separate from my team. So I have um, medical doctors that I work with. So I handle psychiatry, I handle their mental health. The other doctors handle their physical health. They check their heart, they check their lungs, they check their weight, they check like their, their arteries and veins, their cholesterol and everything. And those doctors and I work together. They handle the physical care, I handle the mental health care. And I need their help and they need my help. So we work collaboratively on helping our patient. Gotcha. So it's a teamwork. Mm -hmm. A teamwork that we have. Okay, so my next question is, what is a typical day in your life? Like oh, with, with your job, with your fellowship, and with the uh, responsibilities of a nonprofit well, I will, organization? I will tell you this. To anyone listening, it is very busy. Uh, doctors usually have to work pretty hard, and we do a lot of work. And I would say my day starts early in the morning. So I come when the clinic opens up and the clinic tends to open up around eight o'clock to 8.30. So that's usually when my day starts. I come here to my clinic and I get set up in my office and then I have a schedule of patients that come in. So each day I see a different number of patients. Sometimes I'll see like six patients, seven patients, or sometimes like eight, nine patients, depending on how busy my day is. And each patient has a time slot that they come in. I usually give patients a half hour or an hour for their appointments. So a patient will come to the clinic, they'll call me and they'll say, Dr. Shreve, there's a patient waiting for you. And then I'll go out and meet my patient, bring them into my office, and then we would sit and have our appointment. And during an appointment, I would ask a patient, can you tell me how you're doing? Can you tell me how you're feeling? How have your symptoms been? How bad has your depression gone? How about your anxiety? Tell me about your emotions and feelings. Is anything bothering you? Is there, are there any side effects to medications that I should know about? And I run through all of these questions that I ask my patient. And I try to figure out if they're getting better, if they're staying the same, or if they're getting worse. And then depending on how what my patient says, I'll then make recommendations. 
And then I'll tell my patient, okay, I think maybe the medication isn't working. Let's try a different medication. Or this medication is good, but it's too low the dosage. You might need to increase the dosage so you feel a little better, you know, or maybe I might add another second medication that could help you. So I make these kind of recommendations uh, to my patients. Once I finish the appointment, the patient then leaves and either goes home or they'll see a different member of the team if they have another appointment that they need to see. And then once I'm done seeing the patient, I then have to document my notes, which is basically opening up a computer screen and then typing what I did with the patient. So my note would be something like, I saw the patient, this is the symptoms they complained about, these are my recommendations, this is my diagnosis and my plan for the patient. So you always have to write a note on the patient you see. And then I send a, a prescription of medications to the pharmacy after I see the patient. And this is pretty much what I do for every single patient that comes in. I go through the same process for them. Outside of seeing patients, I do have a lot of paperwork that I have to do. So there's often a lot of forms I have to fill out, a lot of letters I need to write, things I need to do, phone calls I have to make. And then there's doctor meetings that I also attend where I meet with other doctors and I meet with other team members and we discuss issues and problems that may be coming up with patients and what I can do to help in those cases. I tend to wrap my day up around five o'clock, I'd say. Some days are late, depending if it's really busy, but at five o'clock, I'm pretty much done. And that's when I head home and I relax when I get home. Um, oftentimes there are a bunch of people that email me and message me asking for help outside of my clinic. And so I spend some time during the week, I spend a couple of hours helping people off to the side um, with whatever problems or issues they may have or giving them referrals, helping them get connected to different clinics or different doctors that might be able to help them. So all in all, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what like a typical day would be like for me. It seems that you are doing multiple things at the same time. So uh, how do you avoid burnout? Ooh. Yeah, that's a really good question. Wow, that's a great question. Uh, so first thing I'm gonna say is that burnout comes in many different forms. And I would say burnout can be physical burnout. Physical burnout is where my body feels tired. So physical burnout would be like, if I went to exercise or went for a run, I just feel tired <laughs> physically. I can't move my body. So that's a physical like. Uh, burnout. And that burnout happens sometimes, once in a while for me, I have that kind of burnout. Uh, mostly at the gym is where I feel like I have burnout, where I just don't want to move anymore. I just want to go home and nap. Um, then comes the next type of burnout. And the next type of burnout is mental burnout, psychological burnout. And that burnout for me is way more important because that's the burnout where I'm like, oh my God, I feel so overwhelmed. There's so many things on my mind. There's so many problems I have to fix. And I don't have enough time to fix these problems. And so I start to feel overwhelmed. I start to feel like it might be too much. And then because of that, I feel like I can't do it. And so oftentimes my mind kind of slows down and I can only do one thing at a time. One small thing at a time is what I'm able to do. And I need to take a break from work. So sometimes uh, when things get very hectic and busy, and I feel very emotionally or psychologically burnt out, I'll actually leave the clinic and I'll go for a walk around the clinic. I'll go walk outside. Um, we have a nice park right outside. So I'll go sit in the park and I'll listen to the birds and I'll like, you know, look at the trees and the flowers. I'll, I'll take deep breaths in and I'll relax my body and relax my mind. And I'll focus back on myself and say, okay, you can do this. When you go back inside, you'll feel refreshed and you can get back to work. So oftentimes for me, um, you know, yin, it's, it's about taking a break from that. And that's how I can help my burnout. You know, when I feel overwhelmed or feel really stressed, taking that break is so important for me, you know, to do that. So that's what I recommend. You know, that's what helps me. It might help you guys too, anyone listening. You know, taking a break from your work, stepping away and doing something that gives you peace of mind, that gives you calm, can be very helpful for addressing your burnout. What are the most uh, challenging and the rewarding aspects of being a psychiatrist? Ooh, wow. Yeah, these are good questions. The first thing I would say is challenges. Then I'll go to some of the uh, good parts. Um, 
So I would say the challenges of working in psychiatry is that these are very, very difficult cases. They're not easy cases. So for example, if I'm like a medical doctor and someone comes in because they're sick, they have a fever, you know, and what I would do is I would take their temperature. I would listen to their lungs with the stethoscope. I would take a little bit of blood from them and do a blood test. And then based on the results of the blood test, based on the results of the thermometer, I'd be able to tell, ah, see, everything came back in the tests. You have a fever, it's an infection. And now I know how to treat the infection. When it comes to mental health and psychiatry, unfortunately, there are no tests for mental illness. I, I can't take a blood test from someone and the blood test says, aha, it's positive, you have depression, or aha, it's positive, you have anxiety. It doesn't work that way. The only way to tell if someone has a mental illness or not is you have to do an interview. You have to sit and talk to them at length and ask them about symptoms, ask them about signs, ask them about what's affecting them in their life and how it's affecting them. And you have to do a very particular job of asking questions and getting information and then creating the diagnosis in your head of what you feel they may have. Um, and that's a hard part, that there's no easy test for mental illness. And then the second thing is that it's very difficult to listen to some of the stories because people really go through a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. And my job as a psychiatrist is to listen to people's pain and understand where their emotions are coming from, and where their psychological scars are. And sometimes for me, it's a lot to deal with multiple people all telling me about their hurt and their pain and their emotions. Sometimes I feel very heavy. I feel like, oh, this is a lot. I have to now deal with this too. I have to work through my own emotions as I'm dealing with this. So it can be difficult. It can be difficult to, to have to deal with that. And one of the last challenges I would say when it comes to, to being a psychiatrist is the treatment that for other doctors, if someone, say for example, the, the example I gave, someone has an infection, they have a fever and they have an infection, they would prescribe antibiotics. And if you take antibiotics for just a week or two weeks, boom, you're done, you're fine. Infection is clear, you're good to go. In mental illness, it doesn't work the same way, unfortunately. Oftentimes I will give a medication, like an antidepressant or like anti-anxiety, and the medication will take a very long time to take effect. Sometimes it will take a month or even two months for a medication to finally start working, which is a very long time to be on a medication. And even when the medication works, you have to stay on the medication, oftentimes for half a year to over a year, you have to be on medication. So in psychiatry, it's a very slow process. It takes a lot of patience to, to, to work through the length of time it takes for someone to get better. You know, so those are probably the major challenges I can think of for, for the field. And then you ask me again about what are some of the benefits of psychiatry? What makes me um, proud and happy to do the job that I do? And I would say one of the things that I love the most about psychiatry is helping people to feel better about themselves and feel better with their emotions. It's a very hard thing to do that. It's not easy at all to do that. So when you're able to do it, when you're able to help someone talk about their problems and talk about their issues and feel better, feel lighter, feel like they feel happier, they feel more secure, they feel more safe, you know, they're able to connect emotionally to you and feel better about their emotions. It can be a very rewarding thing. It feels very rewarding for me to do that. And oftentimes, a lot of people don't understand mental illness, a lot of people feel scared about their emotions and feelings and they don't feel like they can talk to anybody about that. And so when they come to me and when they open up to me, it feels really nice because oftentimes they tell me like, Dr. Sharif, no one understands the way like you understand or like no one really un that gets me in my emotions the way you do, you know? And I feel, I feel safe with you. I feel like I can open up to you, you know? And it's a very comforting and warm feeling to make that kind of connection you know, with a patient. So that I think is probably one of the most, I think what keeps me going in this field, even though it's very stressful, it's difficult hours and like it can be very heavy for me at times. 
every single time a patient gives me a smile and tells me they feel better, it feels great. That, that I think is probably the best thing about this. What personality types um, can do well in psychiatry? Uh, I would say the best personality types for this kind of work would probably be people who really enjoy talking, who really enjoy sitting and talking to other people and socializing and connecting with other people. Because in my field, when it comes to treating patients, it all comes down to sitting and talking through problems, talking through issues. You can't just do something like a procedure and magically they feel better. It doesn't work that way. You have to talk things through. And that means being a good listener, being very good at listening, being very good at talking, and also being very in tune with your emotions. You know, if you're someone who really likes talking about feelings, talking about emotions, talking about what you're thinking, these are great things. People really enjoy talking about that in this field. So if you feel that that's like you and you want to talk about these things and you like talking and you like listening and you like connecting with people, then this is a great field. I would definitely recommend it. I think that would be super helpful. And then the last thing that I think is very important for being in psychiatry is being very patient, being very patient with this process because of how slow it is, because of how much time it takes to help someone feel better, to get someone through treatment. Oftentimes, if we're short-tempered or we get impatient and we feel very frustrated, this field can be very difficult then. You can, you can feel very um, impatient about it. Why doesn't it work faster? Why can't it get better? How can we ever talk about everything? It's so slow, it takes so much time. It's difficult, it's not easy. And I can see a lot of folks feeling upset about our field and upset with how long it takes. So patience is very important, I would say. What was the real draw for you when you decided to pursue psychiatry? Mm. Oh, you're, you're definitely right about that. I, I think in, when I was in medical school, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. That's for sure. Um, so I, I remember when I was in high school, I was like, no, I definitely want to do medicine. I definitely want to be a doctor. I want to help save people's lives. That's what I want to do. That's like my dream is to do that. And I thought the best way to save someone's life is to be an emergency doctor, an ER doctor. Because if, if you watch all the TV shows and like watch on Netflix and you always see like these crazy shows where the patient gets like helicoptered in and on the stretcher, and the doctor's like, oh my God, prep the, prep the OR. This patient's like going into like, you know, cardiac shock and we need to save their lives. And they press the two electric things on their chest. And then, you know, you, it's, it's so dramatic watching this. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, like I want to do that. Like that looks super cool. Like that's the kind of doctor that like saves a patient's life when they're about to die. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an ER doctor. And in medical school, um, this was, I think, midway through. I was like partially through medical school. Two good friends of mine uh, in medical school, two colleagues of mine, uh, unfortunately suffered from depression. They were feeling really, really low. They were suffering from a lot of symptoms. And uh, they were feeling suicidal. And um, the two of them at different points through the year, the two of them attempted suicide. They tried to, to kill themselves. And thankfully, and I'm very grateful for this, um, you know, they, they survived. They survived their attempt. And I remember how important it was in that moment that I felt, you know, if I want to save someone's life, I don't need like this multi-million dollar, like huge emergency room apparatus, and million dollar MRI machines, CT scans and all this technicality and everything, and helicopters coming in and all that. Like, if you want to save someone's life, sometimes all it takes is just a heart to heart conversation and you can save someone's life. You can help pull them back from their depression just by connecting with them, just by talking with them, making them feel loved, making them feel cared for, making them feel supported. And I decided to switch what I want to do. And I instead 
went into psychiatry. And ever since then, I've dedicated myself to helping other people with their, their emotions and their mind and their behavior to help them feel better and to help them from themselves, meaning having uh, thoughts about hurting themselves or thoughts about dying or thoughts of suicide, helping to save them from that. You know, and this is to me, you know, what I what I dedicate myself to. That's how I save lives. Okay. Would you choose the same career path or change anything about how you did this? Mm, I would definitely choose the same career path. I would definitely do psychiatry, but but I I don't like the way the medical field itself is. And I think what I mean by that is this is a very, very long process. We're talking four years of high school. After graduating high school, you then do four years of pre-med in college. After you finish four years of pre-med in college, you then apply to medical school and it's four years of medical school. Then after finishing four years of medical school, you then do four years of residency. Then after four years of residency, I'm then doing a one-year fellowship. And then finally, after high school, after med school, after residency, after fellowship, you finally become a doctor. And this is such a long process to go through. And if there's one thing I do not want to do again, for sure, I do not want to go through this long, long process all over again. I would not do that. But for me, I like the end result. Of it. I love that I'm a doctor and a psychiatrist. I just think, Ian, it's very painful and long going through the process to become. How should high school students prepare for a career like psychiatry? So it's a bit tough because, it's, like I mentioned before, it's a very long pathway. Right. Um, you know, again, to, to, to make it to this state that I'm, that I'm in. And what I recommend is if you are in high school, one of the most important things you can do to help yourself is to volunteer at your hospital, which may be tough because I know COVID might restrict some volunteering, but you can always volunteer to help at your local hospital, or you can, we call it shadowing. You can shadow a doctor uh, that works at a clinic. And shadowing entails uh, you showing up at the doctor's workplace and then following the doctor and sitting with the doctor as they do their work. So you can get a better idea of what it is a doctor does and how a doctor works through their day and how they see patients and like how they make decisions uh, on treatment. And it can be very exciting for you to do that. So I can definitely recommend volunteering. I'd recommend uh, shadowing. And I'd also recommend doing an internship a clinical internship. So an internship could be working at like a psychologist's office or working at like a mental health clinic um, or working for a, um, a, a hotline, like a suicide prevention hotline or a mental health crisis hotline. Um, these are all excellent things that I recommend for high schoolers and also for college students to help prepare themselves for working in the field of psychiatry. Um, I'd also recommend psychology. So if you're in high school, uh, taking AP psychology can be a great start to building up your knowledge base for, for the field. You don't necessarily need to, it's not a requirement, but it can be very helpful uh, to do that. And then of course in college, if you want to explore psychology more thoroughly, you can major in psychology and then get your bachelor's in psychology. But again, it's not necessary to do that. You don't have to do this. In order, to have, uh, in order to get into medical school. You can pick any major you want and get into medical school, but psychology can be helpful if you're looking to get into psychiatry uh, for that. What are the big subspecialties in psychiatry? Sure, so there's multiple uh, subspecialties that are in psychiatry. So for me, I did my residency in general adult psychiatry. So every single psychiatrist, no matter what they do, and so specializing. Every psychiatrist will always finish adult, general adult psychiatry. So all of us become certified in adult psychiatry. Now, if you want to do something more special than that, this is where you would do a fellowship. So a fellowship after residency helps you to specialize. So that's what a fellowship's purpose is. 
you can always graduate residency and just be a regular psychiatrist, a general psychiatrist. No one has to self-specialize if they don't want to. But some of us have a very particular focus. Some of us have a passion for working with a specific group of people. Therefore, you then go to fellowship and get specially trained to work with them. And that's what a subspecialization means. So there are a few types in psychiatry. It's a very broad field, actually, that you can subspecialize in. And the most popular things to specialize in is child and adolescent psychiatry. So child and adolescent psychiatry is what makes you a child psychiatrist. Your specialty is working with children, working with kids. And kids can suffer from a lot of different mental afflictions. They can suffer from like ADHD, ADD, you know, autism, um, depression, anxiety, dyslexia, learning disorders, you know, difficulty with adjusting, social adjustments. Children also have a lot of trauma that they can deal with. A lot of children come from broken families or are feeling very depressed and anxious because of bullying or difficulty adjusting. You know, so children need a lot of emotional and psychological help. And a child psychiatrist specializes in that kind of treatment. They do a two-year fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry after residency. So a bunch of my friends actually went into child psychiatry and I'm proud to have them as my colleagues. Um, the other fields are forensic psychiatry. So forensic psychiatry are psychiatrists who specialize in the legal system, in the uh, just, criminal justice system. So these psychiatrists are the ones who argue in court. These are the psychiatrists who deal with prison patients, patients who are incarcerated or in prison and also need uh, mental health care. And these psychiatrists are also legal experts. So they help lawyers um, with mental health law and mental health policies. So that's like forensic psychiatry. Uh, another field is geriatric. So just like there's child adolescent psychiatry, on the opposite side, it's geriatric psychiatry. And these are psychiatrists who like working with older people, uh, senior citizens. And the kind of psychiatry delves with uh, dementia, working with like Alzheimer's, working with like um, folks who have lost their memory and have difficulty adjusting you know, to this and older folks who suffer from anxiety or suffer from depression. So geriatric psychiatry is another field. And then um, a fourth major field is addiction psychiatry. So addiction psychiatrists are those who specialize in uh, substance use and substance addiction uh, and helping people who may be suffering from using uh, drugs or gambling or having different types of addiction. Um, so that's another really popular field of psychiatry. For me in particular, my fellowship is in none of that. My fellowship is in public and community psychiatry. And what this means is my specialty of psychiatry involves itself with the mental health care system. So we are sort of like systems specialists. We are able to help run, uh, create, run, and manage our own mental health clinic or our own mental health unit or our own mental health hospital. So it's like a leadership fellowship. It helps you become a leader in psychiatry and to help run programs and create different types of policies. And so for us, we are the psychiatrists that often help mental health institutions or help other psychiatrists with leadership program creation um, and helping patients navigate through the system itself, mental health care system. So that's my specialty in particular. It's a very niche kind of specialty. It's not um, as broadly known as the other fields that I talked about. But for me, I'm very passionate about this kind of work because my field of psychiatry, public and community psychiatry, aims to help the most vulnerable patients, the patients who don't have jobs, the patients who don't have homes, the patients who have difficulty feeding themselves, the patients who have no connections to anybody or anything and are left on the streets. And I create programs and I create systems and services that help these kind of patients. Okay, so what big change do you see in psychiatry in the future? Man, I think the biggest change Yin that I can see happening right now, actually, is what we call telepsych. So telepsych 
is what we're doing right now is actually a big component of that, which is instead of having a patient get in their car, drive over to the clinic, get out of their car and walk into my office and sit in front of me. Instead, all I do is I see a patient online, like the way I'm seeing you right now. Again. I would basically have them jump on their computer and I would sit on my computer and then you and I together would do the same exact interview, the same exact clinical evaluation and appointment online that we would do in person. And I think the future of our field, especially during the whole pandemic and everything that happened during the pandemic, patients couldn't come in to see us in person because of coronavirus. So all of our appointments would be like this. They would be online. And I think the future of our field is more and more and more now leaning towards doing this online where I could be at home and my patient can be at home and we can have a doctor's appointment without ever having left our homes. We can have a doctor's appointment. Everything runs the same way it did before. And the benefit to telepsych is that I don't even need to be in the same uh, state to help someone. So I can help patients that are anywhere in the country. I can help them right from here in my office uh, in New York. And I can even do that internationally. Or if there are patients in other countries, I could also help them in other countries too by just sitting right here in my office here in New York. So it's very, very uh, mind blowing how amazing this technology is and how it's helping us to connect with patients all around the world. And I think this is where the future of psychiatry is heading. It's heading more towards doing telepsych. It is nice and convenient. There's a convenience, of course, of doing this online over telepsych, but there's a lot that's missing, I think, than doing things in person. Me personally, I enjoy having appointments in person. I like that better actually, because when a patient comes in and sits in my office, you get to see everything. You get to see what they're wearing. You get to see how they're taking care of themselves. You get to have them in front of you, little small things that they do, like shifting in their chair or like shaking their leg or like feeling anxious, like you look jittery, you know, little things like that you can pick up on and you can catch and you can ask them about that you would not be able to ask online, that you would not be able to ask over telepsych. And the other important thing is that you're bringing a patient out of their home and into your office. And that's a different thing for a patient that may be at home. Because if a patient's at home, they might have family members there. They might not be able to get privacy. They might have difficult problems or issues at home. And they have a hard time talking to me, if that's the case. You know? So it, it might add a lot of difficulty to a patient to have you do this online. Convenient, yes, but still difficult. You know, and there are some patients that just want to see their doctor in person. They want to be there and have their doctor see them. You know, I can, I can take blood pressure. I can take their temperature. You know, I can actually perform a clinical exam, examine them that I won't be able to do online. So there's a lot of benefits of coming in person as opposed to doing things online. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take. It's a trade-off, I think, for that. So how is... Artificial intelligence AI, AI used in psychiatry. So I don't know exactly. This, this is a bit beyond my expertise, uh, Yin, but I'll try my best to uh, answer. And I think my understanding is that the field of AI, artificial intelligence, I think is growing. And it's, it's expanded far beyond when I first started. In, in high school and in college. And I believe that a lot of the programming for AI will help to advance our field in terms of human psychology. I know that there's a lot of research going into making AI more human, making AI make human decisions um, and having computer programs that have a certain psychology to them or understand human psychology in these programs. And I think AI is gonna have huge breakthroughs in the future. I don't know what applications they have now, to be honest, I'm not really sure what AI would do or, or how AI would apply to psychiatry, but I do know that artificial intelligence is changing just the field of medicine in general. And I know that a lot of computer systems now are able to, you can put in symptoms and the computer will then 
generate diagnoses and generate treatment recommendations. It's, it's powerful what computers are able to do. However, when it comes to psychiatry, I don't think AI is able to have the same effect on psychiatry because unlike the other fields of medicine, where a simple blood test or blood values can give you a diagnosis, in psychiatry, it doesn't work that way. There has to be a human-human interaction with someone in order to come to a diagnosis and be able to give proper treatment. There has to be, which means it's very difficult for you to automate this process or make this a computer-based process. It's very difficult to do that in psychiatry. So I don't see AI making that much headway into psychiatry as it would in other fields uh, of medicine. What advice would you give teens on how to manage uh, anxiety and the pressure like better? Ooh, that's a really good question. So first thing I'm going to say, which is super important, is if you are ever experiencing an emotional crisis or having so much difficulty handling your emotions that it's just you feel like no one understands you, no one gets you. And, and you're not able to find help and you feel alone and you feel inside, you can't handle it. It's very, very important to talk about this. It's very important to open up and it's very important to seek help, seek help for it and not handle your emotions alone. So in high school, I know that every single high school usually has student counseling services. And I would, the first thing I recommend is actually getting connected to student counseling service in your high school. Uh, there tends to be either a social worker or a therapist that each school has on staff. And if your school doesn't have a social worker or a therapist for student counseling services, then your school can help to connect you to those services outside the school, if need be. But I would say this is probably the first thing that I'm going to emphasize, which is get help, seek help for that. I, as a psychiatrist, I'm a doctor and I give therapy to other people, but I see my own therapist. I actually have a therapist that I see and I go for my regular appointments and I'm able to talk about my thoughts and talk about my emotions and feelings. And it helps me. It really helps me. So there's no shame. There's no stigma. It doesn't make you a weak person to seek help from somebody for this. It's actually quite normal to, to seek help from a counselor and seek help from a therapist. So that's the first thing I'm going to recommend. And then the second thing I would recommend is to engage in what we call self care, self-care. Self-care is not just taking care of your body, it's taking care of your mind. And the way self-care works is when you recognize that you're stressed out, you recognize that you may be feeling anxious or very worried or very scared, it's important to take a step back and work through your emotions, work through your thoughts. For some uh, teenagers, I know that they like writing things down. They like journaling and writing. So my recommendation would be to get yourself like a book. Get yourself like a small thing that you can open up every single day and write your thoughts and emotions in it, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, why you feel this way, you know, what kind of things are bothering you and affecting you. It helps to write it out. Other people use singing. Other people use music. Other people have gaming uh, where they play video games to help relieve stress and relieve tension and relieve their emotions. But every single person has a different means of expression. The most important thing above all else is whether you are writing, whether you are playing sports or exercising or whether you're gaming or whatever it is you're doing, socializing. The point of it is, is that you take your inner thoughts and emotions, whatever you're thinking and whatever you're feeling inside, and you get them out, you express them. And that's the most important key to managing your mental health is making sure that whatever's inside of you doesn't stay inside of you. Because the longer and longer something stays inside of you, the heavier it becomes and the more difficult it is to bear that burden. And then oftentimes when your thoughts and your emotions feel so heavy that you can't carry them anymore, this is what leads sometimes to having an anxiety attack or having a, like a, an emotional breakdown. And it can be a very scary thing to experience that. So I, my two recommendations first and foremost are to seek professional help talk to your school counselor or school therapist, or talk to your parents and see if you can get set up with a counselor or therapist if your parents are open to the conversation. I know a lot of families, parents are not open to this conversation and that's okay if they're not. You should still seek help for yourself either way. And your school is a great place to start for that. 
excellent place to start for that because those services are already available for you. And then the second thing I recommend, of course, is self-care. That's the second uh, uh, recommendation I make, which is do all the hobbies and activities and things that bring you a sense of calm and bring you a sense of peace and engage in them regularly. Not only when you need it, but regularly every single day, do a small thing for yourself to take care of your mental health. So that would be my, um, in a nutshell, like my brief recommendation. Yeah, that would be. Would you give uh, to those parents? So it's tough. I mean, how to help their kids to open up? Ah, oh, got it. So it's difficult. I, I think in a lot of parents have difficulty understanding their kids. And because of that, a lot of kids don't feel comfortable opening up to their parents. They feel that their parents will get upset at them or their parents will judge them or their parents will punish them if they have these kind of thoughts. And for some parents, they do. They are like that. And because their parents are, are responding that way, it becomes very difficult for a, a son or daughter or you know, a child to then open up to their parents. You know, oftentimes they don't want to open up because, you know, mom and dad just, they don't understand. They don't get it, you know, or like whenever I try to open up, they shut down the conversation or they dismiss the conversation. They tell me, oh, that's no big deal. Don't worry about that. It doesn't mean anything. Focus on your grades. Focus on your like school. Focus on studying. This stuff isn't important, you know. So there's a feeling of dismissal that they may feel from their parents. And my advice to parents with regards to their children is you need to create a safe, open space to talk about this with your kids, to let your kids know that you're there for them and you're willing to listen. This is really cru and crucial to know. You're willing to listen to what they're saying and what they're thinking, what they're feeling and validate those thoughts and feelings and emotions that they have. And one of the ways that you can do this is by being open yourself about your emotions, which means instead of being angry at your kid and yelling and shouting at your kid, sitting your child down and telling your child, I feel frustrated. I feel upset about this. And let me tell you why I feel this way. It's because you said or did this. And this is how I feel in reaction to that. I don't want to feel this way. I want to feel a different type of way, but that's why I want to discuss my emotions with you. This is what I'm thinking and feeling. Can you tell me what you're thinking and feeling? Having this conversation is a lot more adult, a lot more mature, and a lot more respectful than simply just yelling or shouting at your child. Because then the only thing your child picks up is that you have a temper and they don't want to cross your temper. They don't want to get you upset. Therefore, they're not going to have conversation with you. They're not going to open up to you because they see that you don't handle your own emotions well in that case. So it's important to one be a role model for your children. And that requires a difficult conversation about opening up about your own emotions. And then two, the recommendation I also have is to create a safe space for your child. Be open, be welcoming, and listen to your child when they speak. Give them that respect that, that you demand of them of listening. And then once you've heard them out, tell them how you feel and what you think. And make this a conversation, a dialogue between you and them, rather than a command that you're giving that you have to do this or you need to do that. And that's a few things I can recommend to parents to help bridge the conversation with their children. That's the question is, what advice would you give teens who want to be a psychiatrist? Well, it's gonna be rough um, to go through all this, but if you, if you have the heart for it and you really have a passion for, for becoming a physician, and working in the mental health care field, then excellent, more power to you uh, to do that. And I would recommend getting started early with building your resume in high school, with getting clinical experience, volunteer experience, internship experience, like I mentioned before in the question that Yin uh, asked me. And then in college, expanding on that, getting more clinical experience, doing clinical research, getting yourself involved in pre-med, uh, organizations doing a lot of volunteer work at, you know, health clinics and um, hospitals. And then from there, applying to medical school. And in medical school, uh, focusing on psychiatry in particular, uh, rotations in psychiatry and electives in psychiatry. And then from there, applying to residency and then getting into residency. It's a very long and grueling process. So if you're passionate about mental health, but don't want to go down the route of being a psychiatrist, and that is perfectly acceptable. 
I completely understand not wanting to spend like the first third of your life trying to like become a professional. Then there are plenty of other alternatives that you can have. So uh, a PA, for example, a psychiatric physician's assistant, a psych PA, or a nurse practitioner, NP, psychiatric nurse or a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, other recommendations I would have would be to consider getting a PsyD, P-S-Y-D, a, a clinical psychology doctorate, a doctor of clinical psychology, where they can do everything I can do, only they don't have to go to medical school because they don't need to prescribe medications. They don't need to deal with medications. They simply offer high level, very intensive therapy and psychological testing and diagnosis. It's excellent work that a PsyD can do. Um, if you're interested in giving therapy, giving counseling and therapy and becoming a therapist, then there are plenty of master's programs that you can do right out of college. Like for example, an LMHC, a licensed mental health counselor. So that's a great option for someone who wants to do mental health work and wants to be a therapist, but doesn't want to go down the track that I went with all the time and money that's required to become a psychiatrist. So plenty of options for people to consider in the mental health field without going down the route of psychiatry. And, and I would definitely encourage everyone to look into those options for themselves. Dr. Sharif, thank you so much for your time. Wonderful day.